Welcome to this video about ring circuit testing, why the tests work as they do and some of the problems that may be encountered during the testing process. In this video we hope to show you how to recognise what are good readings and which numbers are the wrong ones, a lifelong skill that will help you in your work. Many times over many years people have told us at Learn Electrics that they know how to set a ring circuit but they are never sure of the numbers, where the numbers come from and why it is so important to know what R1 plus R2 should be. And then how do we measure it, can we calculate it and why divide by 4, what is that all about? Which will lead us on to looking at some wrong readings for a ring circuit test, how do you know when the numbers just don't add up? In this video we are going to use the ring circuit shown here throughout with just three sockets to keep things simple. Let's begin with the commonly taught divide by 4 method. You should all be familiar with this but here we will go into a little more detail. Stick with it and you will really start to understand ring circuit testing by the end of it. Remembering safe isolation we have removed the conductors from the circuit breaker, from the neutral bar and from the earth bar. You should now have two twin and earth cables with exposed ends, cable end 1 and cable end 2. To find R1 plus R2 we need to set our test meter to low ohms and measure between the two line conductor ends often called LL or L1-L2 or just little R1 whichever you fancy. Then we can measure the earth or CPC end to end again called EE or E1 to E2 or little r2. This is the resistance of just the length of the line conductor and then just the length of the CPC. We've made up some numbers, we've said that LL measures 0 0.5 ohms and EE measures 0 0.833 ohms. Now we can add LL to EE and divide by 4, so 1.333 divided by 4 is 0 0.333 ohms. This is R1 plus R2 and this is the figure to put on the test schedule. Now we will show you why divide by 4 works. We can do this by calculation and by measurement. Stay with it, it only gets easier. Let's begin. We need to know the R1 plus R2 value, the effective resistance of the line and CPC or earth. If something goes wrong with the circuit, what is the resistance of the fault path taken by the fault current? But first, some essential basics. R1 plus R2 in a ring circuit is not the same as R1 plus R2 in a radial circuit. In a radial circuit, it is the addition of the conductor resistances in series, but in a ring circuit, it is the parallel resistance that is R1 plus R2 and these are very different. Let's move on and find the parallel resistance of the line and earth or CPC to record as R1 plus R2. Looking at our basic ring circuit it is made up of several lengths of twin and earth cable and each of the copper conductors will have a certain resistance depending on the length of that section of the circuit. We've shown the conductor resistances here as resistors as a reminder that even copper wire has a resistance value. Let's put in some resistance numbers. The longer the length of the cable, the greater the resistance. As we are assuming that this is 2.5, 1.5 twin and earth, the smaller sized earth conductor will have a bigger resistance than the larger line conductor by a factor of 1.667. You'll see how this works as we go along. Now we need to cross connect the cable ends at the consumer unit using crocodile clips, terminal blocks or wagos. Link line 1 to CPC 2 and then link line 2 to CPC 1. Pay attention to the cross connection, it must be as shown, anything else will just not work. Now we can low ohms test with our meter between the line and earth terminals at each socket. Note we do not test at the consumer unit. I've made every conductor here have a different resistance to make the next bit easy to follow. Starting at socket number 1, 
follow the path of the resistances up from S1 to the 0 0.1 ohm resistance through the link to the 0 0.083 ohms resistance then the 0 0.33 ohm and lastly the 0 0.25 ohm resistance and now we are back at S1 but current can also flow down from S1 through the 0 0.15 ohm resistance through the 0 0.2 and 0 0.05 ohm resistances through the second of the links and then through the 0 0.167 ohm resistance to end up at S1. This is what is known as a parallel network and we deal with it in this way. If we add each column we will get 0 0.766 ohms and 0 0.567 ohms. Now the easy bit. Multiply these two numbers together. Then add them together and then divide the first by the second. Pause the video and do the maths yourself. If we do this properly we should get about 0 0.326 ohms for R1 plus R2 depending on how we round up or down. This is sometimes called the MAD method. Multiply, add, divide. And if we measure this with our test meter, we should get about the same number, 0 0.326 ohms. We've used a wavy equals sign here to indicate that it might not be exactly the same. It's an about value. We can do the same at socket number 2, S2. The numbers are shown here. Pause the video and follow the circuit around. Look at the numbers in each column of the chart. They are not all the same numbers as before. Now our two numbers are 0 0.667 and 0 0.666. Let's do our multiply, add and divide again and out pops an R1 plus R2 of 0 0.333 ohms. But why different numbers? Look at this simplified drawing. Testing at S2, using our red test lead, the first resistance in one direction is 0 0.2 ohms and so it follows down the chain all the way back to S2 at the black meter lead. The resistance in the opposite direction, again from the red lead through the 0 0.15 ohms along the chain and back to S2 at the black test lead. Because there are two paths for current flow, which is the idea of a ring circuit, the resistance to current flow will be lower and more current can actually flow. It's like having a dual carriageway. Two lines of traffic can flow at the same time, there are more cars. Socket number three is approached in just the same way. Pause the video and list the resistances in one direction and then the resistances in the other direction. Do the multiply add divide calculation and this time we have a resistance value of 0 0.320 ohms. Measuring the resistance should be about the same value for R1 plus R2. Now we have three readings, all slightly different, and we should record the highest as our R1 plus R2. But is this correct? Do these small differences matter? Well, frankly, no. The maximum fluctuation or spread shown here is just 13 thousandths of an ohm. And that is nothing and easily within the acceptable range. We would consider all these to be the same. And the next question do the different calculation methods match each other? If we use the divide by 4 method, we add the total line resistance, which is 0 0.5 ohms, to the total earth resistance of 0 0.833 ohms from the slide at the beginning. 1.33 divided by 4 is 0 0.33 ohms. Now the parallel method and our multiply add divide calculations. Choose the highest value of 0 0.333 ohms and bingo, they are the same. Either method works. We've also been asked many times about finding a spur. And why are the numbers different for a spur? Here's our ring circuit again, exactly the same as before, links in exactly the same places. But an extra socket is attached, called S4. The ring circuit has not been extended, we have added a spur. The resistance at the spur is going to be the same as at S2 from an earlier slide plus the resistance of the extra line conductor plus the resistance of the extra earth conductor. The R1 plus R2 at socket number 4 is now 0 0.06 ohms for the extra line 
plus all those parallel resistances that made up 0 0.333 ohms for the socket number 2, plus 0 0.1 ohms for the extra earth conductor. This is a resistance of 0 0.493 ohms. What we have a test for is shown here. The middle bit is the parallel network of S2, plus the outside bits, the series path of the spur cable. This is called a series parallel network. Part of it is parallel, part of it is series. And measuring at S4, we're taking all of the series and parallel path into account. When measured, or by calculation, our R1 plus R2 is now 0 0.493 ohms. We've found the spur, but what has it done to the readings? If we measure with our test meter, we will find the readings pretty much the same as shown here until we test at S4 when the resistance suddenly jumps through the roof. This reading is so far from the other values and indicates either a spur or a problem. Removing the socket cover at S2 will tell us the answer. If there are three twin earth cables to the S2 socket, then S4 is a spur. It's easy to make the wrong cross connections too, so let's look at these. If the two lines are connected together, and the two CPCs connected together, as shown, how will this present itself when testing? How will we know that it is incorrectly cross-connected? When we try to make a low ohms test between the line and earth terminals at any socket, we will get an open circuit reading, OL on my meter, or the meter maximum on others. This is because there is no path for current to flow between line and earth. There is no connection. The way that we have connected the links has made two completely independent circuits. This is only a problem when trying to test. When put back into service and energised, the circuit will work normally. Boil the kettle, make you a cup of tea, etc. The most common type of cross-connection error is this next one. Line and earth are connected on the same cable end. L1 is connected to E1 and L2 is connected to E2. As you can see here, the lines are not connected to the opposite earths. They are not cross-connected. We have just connected the ends of the same cable. This is a very common error in testing, especially with unmarked singles. Take a look at the variation in readings on the next slide. If you get funny readings when testing, always check your cross connections. You'll be surprised how often testing problems are actually self-inflicted errors. Again, when we remove the links and reinstate the circuit, everything will work correctly. There is nothing wrong with the circuit, just our testing method. If we test at socket number one, there are two routes of the test current around the circuit. One route involves just a short trip through the two lengths of conductor and the number one link. On the other, a longer route through the number two link, which includes six lengths of copper conductor. When we do our multiply, add and divide calculation, we have a value of 0 0.284 ohms returned for S1. S2 is different, giving a value of 0 0.333 ohms. And then S3 returns a reading of 0 0.120 ohms. Three completely different readings for R1 plus R2, well beyond normal fluctuations. And this should be a big indicator to you that perhaps you have not set up your cross connections correctly. A quick summary then. This video has shown that we can find the resistance value of R1 plus R2 several ways. We can measure it, we can calculate it from the total resistance of the line and CPC, and we can also calculate it from knowledge of each individual conductor resistance. Your actual test measurement should be fairly close to the calculated values. Being able to calculate correctly is a very useful skill to have. If the values that you get are significantly different to what was expected, then search for the reason. For example, this could be a spur off the ring, or loose terminations, and even your own incorrect cross connections at the consumer unit. Always make sure that you've safely isolated the circuit before testing, and always check that your meter is working correctly. And that is it. We hope you've enjoyed this video and hopefully added more knowledge to your mental toolbox. Thank you for watching this video. It is very much appreciated. 
please subscribe to our channel to get access to all of our videos and remember to click on notify to be sure of not missing our next video. And you'll find even more information, videos and help on our website at learnelectrics.com. And don't forget that you can also type in Learn Electrics, all one word, into the YouTube search bar to go directly to our channel at any time from any computer. We are constantly adding new videos to our channel, don't miss the next one. And once again, thank you for watching and we hope to see you again very soon.